So in this video, we're gonna be talking about how to design a code execution system. So what we mean by a code execution system is something where a user can write some code and then they can submit that code to our execution service and the execution service will run the code on the server and return some result. So for example, we could consider that result to be just a yes or no of whether the code ran successfully, maybe some information about the output of the code, etc. A good example of this type of system would be the code editor on interviewpen.com. So we have a bunch of practice problems on our site, and for any one of them, you can write your code and submit it to our testing service, which will evaluate whether or not it passes all the tests. So before we dive into a solution, let's take a look at the requirements. So in terms of functional requirements, we want our system to be able to run any code submitted by a user. And we also want our system to return a result as to whether or not the code ran successfully. In a real world system, our service would also have to be responsible for running tests against the code. But for the sake of example, we'll just assume our system runs the code as is. In terms of non-functional requirements, right, this is where our system gets a little more complicated. We really want low latency when running code, so we shouldn't have to wait a long time for our system to spin up a worker to run the code. It should just run immediately. We also want isolation between different users. So one user running their code shouldn't be able to interact with any of the memory or disk access of another person's code. Along that same vein, we have security. So we wanna make sure that our users can't write malicious code that can either crash our server, degrade other users' experience, or make network requests. And finally, we want our system to be fault tolerant. So if a user's code fails, or if our service fails, either way, we should be able to recover and we shouldn't have any extraneous issues resulting from that. All right, so now let's dive into a solution. The simplest solution here would be to just have a single server. And when our user submits their code to our server, our server would just execute it as a child process. This type of solution is very easy to implement but it comes with a lot of drawbacks. The most obvious drawback is security because our user's code will actually have direct access to the server itself. So for example, our user could write code that kills its parent process, and when it does that, it would actually kill the entire server, and no other users would be able to access it. Users would also have access to the disk, so they could take source code, they could inspect other users' code, and all sorts of problems. While we can use things like C groups that are built into the operating system to prevent our user code from doing certain things, we can never come up with a fully secure system without diving into other solutions. Another issue with the single server approach is reproducibility. So we're actually relying on binaries that are installed on the server to actually run the code. So for example, if we're running Java code, we're relying on the JDK that's installed on this server. So if we accidentally update our server, we've actually now changed the Java version that's available to our users. Ideally, we'd like some more deterministic way to make sure that we're always using a specific version of that dependency. So that brings us to our next solution, which is introducing Docker. So we still just have a single server involved in this, but instead of running the user's code directly on our server, we can actually create a Docker container inside that server and the code will run inside that container. In case you're not familiar, Docker containers are a way to create an isolated environment, sort of like a virtual machine, but with super low overhead. So this isolated environment will have its own dependencies, such as the Java version that we talked about before, and it'll be completely isolated from the actual server system and from other containers running on the same server. So by introducing Docker and introducing a container for every single user, we can significantly improve the security of this system. So while using Docker solves the security problems that we were facing, we're now introducing a problem in terms of scalability. If we want to scale the system to multiple servers, each server is going to have to run a bunch of containers on it, and we might run into some weird issues while scaling. For example, scaling up the number of containers we can run concurrently means introducing more servers that we have to load balance against, which can introduce a lot of overhead. Furthermore, distributing our network traffic across all of these servers won't necessarily distribute all of our containers across all of those servers. For example, if one user is executing very long running tasks, we're gonna end up having much more load on the server that that user happens to be routed to. So to solve these scalability problems, it's best to decouple our server from our container. So to do that, we're gonna introduce Kubernetes. So now instead of running Docker on our server, we're actually going to have a Kubernetes cluster that consists of multiple machines and a control plane that's able to spawn a container on one of those nodes and can automatically handle all of the scalability challenges that come with doing that. Our server is now just a very thin API, which is going to spawn these containers on our Kubernetes cluster and then fetch the result. So we're maintaining our security here because every single task is isolated inside a container and we're solving our scalability challenge by decoupling our containers from our server itself. We can now properly load balance this API here 
and properly scale out our Kubernetes cluster if we need to. And we can do those two things completely independently. The trade-off here is that we're adding a lot of latency. Every time a user wants to run their code, they have to reach out to the server. The server has to reach out to our Kubernetes cluster. Kubernetes has to figure out which node to spawn the process on, reach out to that node, spawn the process, run the code, and then download the result over the network back to the server and then back to the user. This is a lot of steps, a lot of network traffic, and a lot of latency. At scale, this is probably a worthwhile trade-off. But there are some improvements that we can make to make the process a bit faster. A lot of the overhead of the Kubernetes solution comes from the fact that we have to schedule a new container on one of our Kubernetes nodes. So if we can keep a standby container running that's always able to run the next user's code, we can solve some of this latency challenge. So as soon as we spin up our server, our server is going to be responsible for spawning the standby container on our Kubernetes cluster. This container won't do anything yet, but it'll be standing by ready to take in a user's code and run it as fast as it can. So once a user makes their request to the server, our server will send the code to that standby node and get the result. And at the same time, it'll also spawn a new container that can be used as the new standby node. Once the code finishes running on the first node and we've gotten the result back, we'll still want to delete this node and use the new standby node for the next user. And that'll ensure that we have a fresh environment and that we maintain security. So nothing fundamental is changing here. All we're doing is creating the container that our user is going to use before they actually make the request to our server. So by making this process asynchronous, we can reduce the latency for our users. One interesting thing that we'll note here is that our server now has some state. Our server has to remember that it created the standby pod. And if our server fails and gets recreated again, it might end up creating a second standby pod. And we now have this useless container sitting here in our Kubernetes cluster that will never get run. An easy fix for this would be to simply time out the container after a certain amount of time. And then we have to build logic into our server to make sure that the container hasn't timed out before we run code on it. However, this is certainly not an optimal solution. And I challenge you to think about a way that you can create this system in a way that isn't stateful. So this might involve adding some extra moving pieces to our system to ensure that state isn't stored directly on our API. So in a real world system, things can get a lot more complicated. We have to introduce a lot of logic to actually run the code correctly and make sure that we can run tests on it and get the right result for our users. And there's a ton more performance optimizations that we can make to make the system faster for our users. But this video should have given you a general idea of how you'd approach problems like this and build a solution that's both scalable and secure. If you enjoyed this video, you can find more content like this on interviewpen.com. We have tons of more in-depth system design and data structures and algorithms content for any skill level, along with a full coding environment and an AI teaching assistant. You can also join our Discord where we're always available to answer any questions you might have. If you or a friend wants to master the fundamentals of software engineering, check us out at interviewpen.com.